um, you know, is closed like that. I think there was a lot of um, there was a lot of stakeholders and a lot of interested parties that were naturally sort of worried about something like that. And there were competitors, there were patrons, ex-patrons, but I think more interestingly there were people who were outside of the normal circle who were looking at this and thinking, well, this isn't right, this is this is no different to shutting down the Royal Albert Hall or, mm. or the English National Opera at the Coliseum. And when, you, when those sorts of levels of support are coming out from the Royal Albert Hall or from the e &O, and you're getting that level of um, support, I suppose, but, uh, but, but interest in the fact that, that fabric was considered to be so much more than just a nightclub playing mm. repetitive beats, you realise that, that the importance of it, and, and I think that then you start getting a sort of a shift in narrative from those that perhaps were offside on early message, and it starts building up. A, and, and I suppose that's where I think we were sort of slightly not unprepared, but we just weren't we weren't re really seeing that sort of thing prior to our closure, and suddenly there was huge interest from the press, and, mm. and you know they were wanting to get onto this story, not about the closure of nightclub, but because of um, you know what fabric stood for. Welcome to another episode of Big Risk Energy. And on this week's episode, I am blessed to be joined by the one and only Cameron Leslie. Cameron, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very Nice to meet you and great to be here. So Cameron, how do you describe yourself to someone you're just meeting? Well, a little bit of a mixed bag, really. Uh, difficult to sort of pin down if somebody asks me what I do um, to try and explain it. Elevator pitches have never been... Uh, have quite worked because it's uh, it's all over the place. But um, uh, I would say uh, jack of all trades, really. Yeah, jack of all it's trades. Probably master of a couple. Still trying to work that one out, but yeah, probably a couple. But um, yeah. Nice, love that, love that. Well, obviously, Cameron, you are one of the co-founders, are one of the co-founders of Fabric Nightclub uh, Club, which was very, very close to my heart and probably for many, many, many thousands and thousands of people. Mm. But I want to know, when you co-founded Fabric, mm. could you see at that point how big that club was going to be, what an institution it become, the accolades that it's won? Did you see it was going that way? Uh, no, because I, I, I would say the, the blueprint wasn't there to do something like that. I think we set out to be an anti-brand. I mean, the word sort of disruptor um, didn't really exist at that point. We didn't really sort of set out to be um, anything other than um, true to, I suppose, the the, the ideas that, that, that Keith, Riley um, and myself sort of had at that time, the team that we had to create something that we wanted to do. Um, and that was incredibly different to what was around, obviously, in the late 90s. Um, and it was, um, I suppose, an anti-brand in, in, in comparison to the other big venues. I, I hate the word super club, but, but they were super clubs and we didn't want to be a super club. We just wanted to be an underground music venue, which was for people that, of all kinds that liked electronic music. and and wanted it given to them in a way which was had care and consideration at every point, not just in terms of the sound system and the booth and the dance floor, but everything from sort of entry to cloakroom to bars to toilets, just that those things were actually taken care of. So, so no, we didn't really sort of set out with some kind of, you know, world vision and, you know, five-year plan and, you know, nothing as grandiose as that. It was literally just make it up as we go along but try and do a better job next weekend than we did last weekend and keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that and actually we still keep them doing that as we're sort of approaching 25 years so so no we didn't have anything like that I would probably say Keith um, probably had grander ideas than me in terms of that but he's much sort of I think bigger thinker and less realist I would be sort of thinking about the problems and how to overcome those challenges, whereas he'll just think, big picture, blue sky, straight away. And so if you asked him that question, he probably would say absolutely, but no, I didn't, not at all. Uh, amazing, amazing. And when you first had that vision and considering how different it was to the other things around at the time, 
how was that received by people in the industry, people who you were competing with, or they must have felt you were competing with them? And what was the reception like from people? Were people ready for that type of concept? Uh, they didn't know. And, and the truth was, you know, we were nobodies. We didn't have any track record. There was no, um, you know, we were really having to... I mean, we put something out there in a kind of a stealth manner. And that in itself was um, alternative to what, to the noise that was going on at that particular time. Because, um, there, you know, and if you look at sort of the press, the music magazines around that time, there was this battle of the two big venues that were going to open that year, which was home on Leicester Square and Fabric in, you know, the far-flung East London wastelands. And, you know, people just couldn't, a lot of people just couldn't get their head around why anybody would venture as far out as, you know, Charthouse Street in Islington. It just, you know, didn't make sense to people. And, and so, so there was a lot of preconceived ideas from the kind of the mainstream industry um, that, uh, that home was um, the place to sort of cast their attention because of the big names and the glitzy sort of location. But there was obviously a very, very vast group that were not taken with that kind of address and were looking at the more sort of interesting things that we were sort of perhaps planning. And the truth be told, you know, on the first opening night from that point onwards, it just, you know, it just absolutely took off. And, uh, you know, we knew we had something... Um, pretty serious on our hands from that literally from that opening stage but the build-up to it was very very understated and um, you know our whole sort of campaign about opening was very much about trying to leave people guessing and mm. questioning what it was rather than just telling them very obviously this is what it is you know and uh, and I think that you know that paid dividends when we actually got to the opening point well certainly not from the operational team on the front door <laughs> but for the rest of it it was fine so it was literally first night you were yeah. like, right there's something here and you mentioned it was about week by week at that stage yeah. trying to create a better product trying to put on better nights I mean w what was that learning curve like after day one well you've got to split it into two one was the booking programming curation music delivery team and then you had the operational team and that operational team, which I suppose I was at the core of at that particular point, um, was <laughs> it, we didn't have any kind of experience in opening a venue of that size and also handling the interest and the sort of, I suppose, the tidal wave of people that were coming in every night. This wasn't us doing an event. This was from opening night, I think we did three, then we had a pause for two, and then we were open for 40 nights on the trot. <laughs> and so there was never any point of being able to sort of catch up. You know, as much as I'm kind of wax lyrical and give you a little sound bite about next weekend, the reality was, you know, we'd be going home, going to bed and getting up, you know, an hour or two later and going straight back in to try and just stay afloat for the next night because the systems, the team, nothing was kind of ready if you like or tested to the level that it needed to be for a venue of that sort of size and magnitude and handling the number of people that we just couldn't even get in let alone were coming in so so there was there was tons that that you know you just literally had to stay afloat on tons of things that we just literally had to survive on mm. before we could kind of get the breathing room to be able to sort of start fixing them to be able to then start improving and improving and and it, it probably took a full year to well whether whether the product did but in my own head i was constantly looking at all the things that needed to change needed to change before i sort of got to a point where i just thought do you want know this is actually clicking now properly mm. and you know the team was in place and you had the right team to continue post-launch versus the team that was there at the beginning who mm. you know i didn't know most of them so i wasn't handpicking these people or this was my tried and tested team that had come you know like when we've done other things subsequent you know i've been able to take the right people with me to do those and it's obviously a lot easier than starting from you know a complete clean sheet and yeah point zero so so it was hard that first year particularly was 
was really tough. Can imagine. And you said, you know, you guys originally built this because it was a product you wanted to see in the market. It was something you guys wanted mm. to experience from an operational perspective. Can imagine it wasn't always, uh, you know, getting to experience it on the fun side. I mean, mm. How long till you were like, right, I can actually just go to a night at Fabric without being terrified. Everything's going to fall down in a second, you know? I would, well, I would say the sort of the the click moment, as I said, was literally the first birthday. Right. And I think because it was a much longer night and went on past normal hours and, you know, where birthdays now sort of go on 36 hours, mm. I think I think we got to about 18, 20 hours or something. We, we rolled that one on. And I just remember being on the dance floor at sort of one in the afternoon on that on that Sunday afternoon. And, and it was the first time I just thought, I looked around and just thought, wow, this is this is great. This is really special. Whereas up till then, you're constantly with a earpiece in and you're constantly, as much as it might be going off, <laughs> you're listening to the fact that bar two's run out of change or, yeah. you know, there's a problem on the door or they've run out of this or this is a problem or this has happened. And so all you're dealing with is fires all the time. Mm. And it doesn't matter what else is going on. And, you know, you, you really want everything else to be absolutely fine. So you switch off to everything that's fine and just concentrate on what is a problem and so it wasn't until I perhaps had that little epiphany at that point that then things perhaps started to change and of course you know I was getting a good team in my, my I was never going to be the sort of on night operational manager for the rest of my days you know um, and so you know we started to get the right management team in right senior operational team to be able to manage something which was such a logistics mm. military operation as that and from that point on it then started to change for me personally because I was able to step away at various points and you know proper specialists take over <laughs> on those things and and uh, and that was when you know certainly not only my role internally but you know personally for within fabric I was able to um, you know perhaps enjoy it in a slightly different way to mm. how it was before so yeah and that uh, makes total sense and it's uh, always a nice time as a business owner when you realize you got to bring the proper grown-ups in right you know right. what they're doing exactly <laughs> exactly and you know what it was it, it, the, the, that's sort of how it is to this day the only time I kind of really step into certain things is when there's a problem or, or, or a hole to fill or you know you really need to sort of scrutinize certain things and and you know aside from that we have got and always have had really good people in the right places mm. because you do want those specialists, those people who have great wet trade experience and understand about GP and par levels and, and, and stock turnaround and shelf life and those sorts of things to to be in the right place to be able to handle those. Um, certainly on an operational level, I haven't even talked about the music curation side. I, I, so. I want to get into that, don't get me wrong. So one question I have is you said, you know, a year really for it to feel like it hit uh, operational milestone mm. where you're like this is this is great on that side but from like a music perspective mm. how long after launch was it okay now top talent in the world are coming to us saying we mm. want to play the club rather than the other way around I mean just tell us a little bit about that journey well we we we, we had the right artists to kick off with um you know that we we had the artists that we wanted to straight away um and so we already had who, uh, who were they at the time well Sasha, for example, you know, he was doing, he, he did a monthly night with Craig Richards and Lee Burridge, Tyrant, and that artist like Sasha at that particular time, you know, he was, he was able to, or that particular night was able to shine a light on a lot of other um, lesser known talent as well. And that was the whole point behind the club is that, you know, we were getting artists like Sasha to come in, not because they were Sasha, but because it complemented uh, a lineup that we could put together that drew attention to people that were coming to see Sasha or to see Tyron that were able to then suddenly find themselves in room two or room three listening to um, Errol Bricker mm -hmm. or artists that I just plucked that name out of the air because I just saw a flyer the other day with him on <laughs> uh, but artists that they may never have heard of before or see a live act that you know we'd flown in from sort of Denmark or something like that or an Icelandic duo that were on in room three and suddenly people were taking notice and able to see things that that they weren't before and and that was the whole point about it was that it was a you know a curated 
night as a whole, not just us booking by mm. numbers of a, an artist who could pull those numbers in because, you know, that wasn't what it was about and never has been. So, you know, that, the rest of that programming um, that was done incredibly sensitively and, and, and obviously what, you know, I hope we're known best for, um, that mark was, was set straight from, from day one. And so, you know, we had a lot of great support from artists that, that bought into the concept. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly they wanted to see it in, in reality, but, you know, given that we had the likes of, um, you know, John Digweed, Tony Humphreys, um, Sasha, all sort of pretty much in the same weekend, um, you know, and that's not even talking about the sort of the drum and bass community, which, you know, we really championed straight from day one. Um, you know, there was a couple, there was some good stuff going on, but it really didn't have quite the home that we mm. gave it from day one. And I think, you know, that quickly turned into the very, very obvious um, directional shift for us was that we had Fabric Live on a Friday mm -hmm. once a month at that particular point, might have even been less, might have been once every six weeks, but... We, we and then, and then we had sort of, you know, other things like Talvin Sings and Noka. Um, we were kicking off with Big Beat Boutique, Bugged Out, um, we Vapor. We had a number of sort of external promoters, if you like, coming in on the Friday night. And, you know, we really quickly worked out that Fabric Live had such strength to it and it was doing so well just on that one in four mm -hmm. that we then shifted it round to being three and four with one external to then in the January of 2000, then going every Friday was Fabric Live and every Saturday was Fabric. Yeah. And that was the, that was the blueprint for us for, for f going forward. So, yeah. um, so, you, you know, we, the, the programming team took a lot of confidence from being able to b boost up, boost up and strengthen and, um, you know, the programming that they were doing at that particular time rather than sort of thinking, geez, we're, we're overstretched here. Let's sort of shrink this down and mm. bring others in. Um, it went the other way. So, so yeah, on, on the curation side, it was, it was going great guns. Yeah, it's incredible. And I, so I started going to Fabric probably like 2006 mm. and yeah, it was every Friday night, it was Fabric Live and that was, that was what we went to. And it was one of the, the things I could see is I remember maybe at that time it would be like, you know, players in in room one for mm. example and then i remember discovering because this is the thing back in 2006 you know the roots to music discovery were not what they are today no as you you know of course and you know i remember being like seeing like a, a dub police in room two or something like that and just seeing all these new genres come through fabric and evolve over years mm. and then maybe going out the other side and getting into mainstream i mean how how quickly did it take you guys to see that not only were you you know supporting you know, young talent and, and curating these amazing nights, but actually really creating careers and creating genres through the club. I don't think, we didn't do it in a calculated way. Otherwise, sure. if we had done, we would have controlled their careers and managed them, owned them, whatever. But but we but we never did that. And, and that wasn't, it wasn't the intention to be this kind of, you know, ulti, ultimate power broker on the music industry. We were just wanting to run the club. And we knew that by being able to sort of incubate scenes and audiences and different tribes um, using the three different rooms, that um, with that sort of nurturing and incubation, you were going to be able to develop and build something and take those sort of elements, if you like, on bit of a journey whether that's through room three mm -hmm. to room two to maybe room one and not using those as kind of a hierarchy but just in terms of their size you know they, they could obviously handle more as you went into different rooms so it, I, I think we were we were it wasn't by accident we knew that we were what we were trying to do in terms of building things but that's kind of natural and it, it just it's just it takes some fortitude to be able to um, stick by something mm. sometimes um, and it's easy to look back in hindsight on the things that did work and say yeah that was the right decision on that and you know 
you know, I mean, I could give you sort of half a dozen different scenes and and you know that we really sort of did champion and 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 really got behind and and some of them were slow burners. You know, they mm. weren't they weren't straight off the straight off the bat every single time. You know, they needed the right support and the right nurturing and and you know some of these things needed quarterlies for for a good year to be able to sort of really keep that interest and keep something special it wasn't sort of weekly events mm-hmm. and so so yeah it was they were they were treated they were treated well and they were treated with respect in terms of you know we didn't just sort of jump on a a bandwagon mm-hmm. and then expect it to work overnight and if it didn't it was dumped uh, mm-hmm. the following week you know there was always genuine thought and 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 consideration behind you know what we were trying to to build and with whom and whether they wanted to do it with us or whether mm. they saw us as less of a stepping stone that sort of thing didn't exist then in the same way that perhaps it does now um you know they're, they're beyond fabric there wasn't you know you once you sort of reached that point you know it really didn't sort of go too far mm-hmm. from there so that's why i think there's more generationally different loyalty to now and that's not saying that a younger generation a younger artist isn't loyal but the place of a club has a different place now to when it did perhaps in the sort of late 90s noughties where that was where people went now mm. of course you've got big events pop-up events festivals career trajectory management which have mm. you know very very different opinions about wanting to keep their artist in the same place they want them to play in churches and tiny pop-ups and all sorts of places so mm. you know you're competing as a um as a promoter and a, and a booker with a completely different landscape now to how we were perhaps operating then so it's super interesting and um so so much uh, amazing stuff in there i think having seen you know firsthand uh, as a as a punter at, you know 18 years old just the the movement of genres of scenes from you know room to room in that way like seeing it with grime with dubstep mm. at the time and i think you know to a point at that time anyway grime like 2006 let's say mm. super early on and seeing like bbk and then you know all those guys coming through and it not grime not really being mainstream to like 2015 no. you know, like nine years later so i think the foresight there is incredible it must be a super fulfilling part of the journey to you being mm. like yeah knew we were onto something mm-hmm. and seeing that that uh you know really blow up 10 yeah. years later or whatever um but how when you talk about you know now the changes in the way that artists see clubs and, and management see clubs how do you guys try to remain at the forefront uh despite all those challenges um good question i think it's a by having a fixed 52 week a year venue you're able to stay on top of um i suppose the, the sort of the quality and the service and the the systems that are in place they're constantly being worked on by a full-time team so you benefit from having something in play all the time rather than a stop start a seasonal where you're kind of perhaps got um quality issues on staffing um you know the 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 sound system our team are just working on it every single week the lighting they're cleaning every single week it's a it's a very cyclical routine in terms of keeping on top of that so you know that you have a quality product you know that you have something that um, artists do want to play at and so it's not necessarily um, convincing people you know to, to pick you it's just ensuring that the frequency of certain things and the seasonality now more than anything else that's probably more the challenge is mm. the fact that you have such um, 52 weeks a year venues compete with festivals which are you know quite a lot of them are incredibly powerful and command such high figures for artists and they're such important plays for them that they have huge blocks obviously on their um exclusivity time Mm. so you can be blocked sort of three months before and sometimes sort of a month to two months afterwards so somebody could be out for five months and so you're then faced with the, the congestion that you've got this opportunity in Q1 or Q4, but Q2 and Q3 can sometimes be very thin in comparison. So the artists think you're always there and they're always there for you within the calendar, 
but what you ideally want the utopia position is you know 12 months a year you're able mm. to select what you want when you want and you know june july if people are disappearing off summer holidays you've got to work extra hard to be able to um you know to to get them to want to come to the venue in 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 those summer months mm. so it's kind of a double whammy you don't off, you you don't have the talent that you need sometimes and you don't have the audience when you don't have that talent as well so it's a kind of a double hit in the in the in the summer months sometimes so you've got to just you just got to work incredibly hard to make it count in those times um you know it's not a given yeah yeah and i guess that's why q4 is such a such an important so important, so important you know from october through to to march it's it's you know the winter months in the UK. It's a it's a it's a much better time for clubs than you know hot blazing hot day in July where people yeah. are going to want to be outside in a field and you know they might be off in Europe somewhere and you know it's it's a it's a different it's a different environment. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. Super interesting. Taking it back to you know all the things that you guys have cultivated in the music scene in, in London and, and beyond. Mm. When Fabric was being threatened by shutting down. Um, what seemed, you know, externally to be just the widespread support of the music community to to save the venue. I mean, talk to us a bit about that and, and how was that? That must have been, again, so fulfilling to see how many people came to support considering all the work you guys put in to, you know, lift up, lift up the ecosystem. Mm. It was a strange one because, you know, the... Uh, I think that the, the wider... Um, acknowledgement that a venue like Fabric was actually a cultural institution mm. and up until that point I don't think beyond the sort of the tight electronic music scene it was it was considered that way I think it would have been a bit too sort of grandiose to use the word cultural institution alongside it was a you know I think you, you would have sounded like an absolute <laughs> tosser if you'd said that prior to but but there was a lot of things that just arrived at exactly that point and that was um, there seemed to be a significant amount of closures or no new new openings, probably more more so. So we we seem to have hit a sort of a, a bottom point in terms of you know the in, the industry. You had um, you had more complex and more difficult licensing regimes for the operating for the existence of those um, venues that were obviously still going. And so, when a venue as well run as Fabric. Um, you know, is closed like that. I think there was a lot of um, there was a lot of stakeholders and a lot of interested parties that were naturally sort of worried about something like that. And there were competitors, there were patrons, ex patrons. But I think more interestingly, there were people who were outside of the normal circle who were looking at this and thinking, "Well, this isn't right. This is." This is no different to shutting down the Royal Albert Hall or, mm. or the English National Opera at the Coliseum. And when when those sorts of levels of support are coming out from the Royal Albert Hall or from the E&O, and you're getting that level of um, support, I suppose, but uh, but but interest in the fact that that fabric was considered to be so much more than just a nightclub playing mm. repetitive beats you realize that the the importance of it and and i think that then you start getting a sort of a shift in narrative from those that perhaps were offside on early message and it starts building up a, and, and i suppose that's where i think we were sort of slightly not unprepared but we just weren't we weren't re really seeing that sort of thing prior to our closure and suddenly there was huge interest from the press and, mm. and you know they were wanting to get onto this story not be about the closure of a nightclub but because of um you know what fabric stood for and so it started bringing to the fore so many conversations that we perhaps hadn't had before meanwhile we're obviously having to battle to get our venue open which you know was was obviously incredibly difficult at, you know in itself so so it was it was a very very um positive and confirming period amongst the very sort of difficult frustrating you know and you know we did go through or you know I can only talk personally actually but you know the sort of the the levels of emotion and the change in those emotions mm. from being really 
angry um, that, you know, at the situation that we found ourselves in to sort of, I suppose, the relief to being able to get ourselves open, then coupled with how difficult it was to get that momentum back mm. and just how I was talking about how good it was to get going in 99, that was not the same in January 2017. That momentum took so much more to try to build up and a lot of lessons going then into the closure in COVID that we were prepared for. Perhaps, I won't say that others weren't, but we were very fresh as a team mm. from having been closed and what being closed meant and more importantly what getting reopened after a closure was about and you know I literally the day after jumping forward to COVID but the day after Boris sort of said to people don't go to pubs and clubs he didn't have the the guts to be able to deal with telling us to close he just told mm. people not to go um, but anyway the day after that sort of infamous speech I sat down with the team you know who were clearly just facing now uh, you know <laughs> A, a, another big stint on the sidelines um, and said, you know, when we actually get to reopen here, we're not going to be the same club as we we were yesterday when mm. we closed because we knew we were going to come out of the traps once that green light came on at a pace that we hadn't done when we reopened in 2017. And and I think we've benefited a lot from that that experience of being shut down in 20 much as I didn't want it wow we learned so much when we actually then went into the covid shutdown both financially in terms of shutting the cash taps off very fast but also the the using that close period productively to reset certain things and and do certain things and then on the sort of on the front foot getting reopened um you know, at a, at a pace, you know, we really, really made sure we got that momentum straight away and, and it really benefited us and has benefited us since. Wow. It's so interesting because I've, I've always had this uh, conviction about life that our worst moments will always become grateful for eventually. Mm. And I guess it's one of those where it's like, okay, we've been here before and uh, yeah, you know, suddenly that, that closure in 2017 had, or, or reopening in 2017, suddenly had all these upsides to it, which you just couldn't have imagined, mm. right? There wasn't... I would say that sort of the narrative on Fabric's cultural position was 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 an absolute highlight, mm. and then I would say the negative learnings were constructive. Beyond that, I don't think there was too much from that closure of that time that I could say, you know, were were overly positive. Yeah, it was, of it was it was it was really it was a really difficult experience going through. And I would say the aftershocks from it were probably worse. They, running the venue from that 2017 through to closure, not having that momentum and mm. having a venue like Printworks open at the same time. And that first quarter diary that we had completely all sewn up from January through to March in 2017 all disappeared off to Printworks because we weren't going to reopen and artists mm. needed to play in London. And so a lot of relationships that we had cultivated that were at we had those relationships and what those, those artists would have been loyal to us naturally had to shift off because mm. they had to obviously think about their careers and you know we gave that our blessing because we weren't due to re reopen but having then reopened and seeing your your nights at another venue which was now had that momentum mm. and and you know that was that was tough and and we had to we had to work really, really hard to sort of re-establish things. And that's why, as I say, that sort of post-COVID, I look back on that closure, not with fond memories, but I sure. look back on it with a lot more positivity in terms of what we achieved from it and, and how we used that time yeah. through no fault of our own being closed, but we used it really constructively and positively. And yeah, I would say we came out very very strong on the other side of that so and do you feel now that the club from like an operational perspective yeah. and all those changes you made during the covid closure is you know far better than it was before yeah definitely 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean you know just just down to to using that downtime in the venue for the first time to be able to do work on things like toilets and mm. you know giving pulling bars down and rebuilding them because they, they you know they were never right in 99 and so but you could never have a more than a five day stretch to do something and suddenly you know so you know the makeover that we were able to give the venue mm. you, sort of dismantling your team and then being able to rebuild it on the other side allowed you to 
change the structure of certain things and bring certain people in who weren't in the team before and you know let um, sadly let go of certain people mm. because it didn't quite fit the structure of of what you wanted to do but you were you were sort of structurally fit for 2021 onwards and ready to go um in a way that perhaps in March 2020 we were awkwardly compromising on certain things mm -hmm. because we just had to get on with it you know and so so yeah I, I would I would say COVID was a reset in many ways for for us and for the industry and I think we we knew how we wanted to respond and and you know looking back on it I think we did super interesting thank you for that and uh, re really good to understand how, how you guys um took that second closure and, and the experiences you had so one thing that we discussed when we spoke probably a couple of months ago mm. now was um favorite fabric moment of mine which was the screaming benga reunion um after all those years so many amazing moments mm. that you know you've had what are some of your top fabric moments if you had to pick a couple what would they be um I'm glad you said uh, pick some moments because because yeah. because <laughs> trying to pick a one exactly. it, it, it doesn't work and so so you know some some absolute highlights for me um, w w was that first birthday that was um, that was really special moment because that was that was just I just sort of I understood and understood to myself what I'd done and what I'd given up to try and do this venue and at that moment it sort of made sense so you know that was that was a great moment just in terms of the venue itself um but musically uh you know i've 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 seen so so many things in there and you know i've just been excited by so many things that i'd never heard of before or never seen um and i think just the breadth of um being able to stand either in the crowd or on the lighting desk or on the side of stage and and just witness the energy that goes on in that place constantly um uh, you know I, I could literally pick a hundred moments like that so i'll kind of bundle those together um i would say reopening after covid was was really um that was a good moment and and, uh, and that really stood out and i would say the energy that was in the venue, not just at that sort of that first night, but for months and months afterwards. And I'm not saying it's not like that now, but mm. there was something particularly different then. You genuinely felt it, not just from a little group that was coming in that can energize around them, but collectively everybody was was had this same, it wasn't pent up because that makes it sound like it just all was crazy. It, it, and it wasn't, it was just this, sort of gratitude with mm. being able to do something that you know for quite a period of time you thought maybe we'll never be able to do something like that ever again mm. and and it was just this it was just this feeling I, I would imagine that you know in, in something like wartime when people are allowed to let go just for a little bit and it, it just is unbridled and absolutely natural in in the joy that people had in that moment of escapism and and it just made for some some fantastically wonderful energized nights that you just felt it from beginning to end and it and it wasn't just one night it was yeah. night after night after night and so so there was a definitely a I hate the word honeymoon but there was that sort of there was a real sort of honeymoon period after covid that went on for for quite a while that you 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 felt that and you thought god this is this the new mm the new world <laughs> is it going to be like this all the time and the people sort of and I think there was a real positivity to that in the fact in the fact that you thought people have rediscovered um live being in the moment of something and not watching it through a stream and not doesn't matter if it's in 4k yeah ultra hd being around people you just can't recreate that and you can't capture that in any other way other than doing it and and perhaps you know, pre-COVID, people had got a little bit sort of blasé about mm. that sort of thing. And suddenly the, the actual, how special that was, really came out. And and I think that it probably had, that probably has carried on since, you mm. know. I think people's in, placing the importance on 
live social activities like that, whether it's watching live music or listening to it in a live capacity, it's. I, I think there's definitely been a, a re-emergence of the importance of that within people's social diaries. So yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I I see that completely, and and I feel like I experienced that in that pre-COVID period where it almost felt like a lot of live. Ex- Mm. live experiences uh live experiences were more set up for how this is going to look on tiktok or on phone yeah. after rather than the live experience and certainly for me fabric's always been a place where actually the live experience they're not through a phone screen experience yeah. has been incredible and yeah that renewed appreciation for that post covid i can see why that would work so well well it's interesting you say that because one of the things that we actually put in place in 99 was a no camera policy, but yeah. that was cameras in the traditional <laughs> sort of sense because um, we didn't want that sort of, uh, it's probably unfair if, if anyone's listening from there, but that <laughs> club of vision, you know, it, it wasn't about the eyes. This mm. was a club about the ears and it was about almost sensory deprivation mm. on the eyes so that you were forced to really be overwhelmed on on the ears and and the sound and so that no camera policy probably lazily of us but we didn't keep up with the sort of the trend on 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 phones um and and didn't keep a pace of that in the same way and so when covid came along we actually made the decision to enforce that policy on on camera on camera phones so when people come in and they get searched um, we would put a sticker over the lens of, of the phones and, you know, there are signs up in the venue. And while we don't have a sort of a phone police going around and, and you know, pe- security will ask people to put their phones away and we really want people to almost self-police it in mm. terms of that. And so, and, and it's, it's it, you know, it's it's definitely made a really big difference. And, you know, it was something that, as I say, we're just, we just reset a number of things we didn't bring something in new we just reset back to something that we had in place before but as time shifted on perhaps those things sort of slightly morphed into something else so mm. um and I, and I would say that that made that's made a you know a massive difference to the dance floor and and people being in the moment rather yeah. than trying to live it through um uh, you know capturing the right instagram you know, shot and 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 real and whatever we you know, they're trying to do for that, um, you know, for that moment, and it it's made a massive difference. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, um, and it's I didn't know you guys were doing that again. I think it's amazing. It was one of the reasons why I I really felt like going to festivals in that like 2017, 18 period. Maybe it's a bit before that was so much better because your phone was dead after a day, mm. and therefore you were back to that reality that that live that that freedom in a way um it's yeah, amazing to hear you guys are doing that is it we got we got a couple of interesting shots from the same point on the balcony there and one was from 2001 and there was people in the crowd just standing there with lighters yeah and it was it was just all sort of these these bright little flames in 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 the audience and then there was another one facing a live act in about I think it was about 2017 or something like that and it was just phones everywhere yeah, yeah, yeah filming something on stage and then there was another one in 2021 the same point and it was just completely dark on the floor and completely dark same number of people in there and it was just interesting seeing these kind of three different points that none of those could have happened at that other point in time yeah. um you know People aren't carrying lighters. <laughs> yeah, 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 on the dance floor, people in 19, 2001 weren't didn't have phones that had that sort of capability, and so you know, just seeing those kind of movements all within one space, um, you know, really interesting. I wonder what that would be like in five years' time, Probably ten just years' the time. Light so. from vape pens, possibly, imagine, yeah. <laughs> whereas they teleport back home. You know, these kind of. <laughs> no, that's incredible. That's incredible. You should. You, you guys got to put that picture on Instagram or something. Yeah. Well. Three. That, counterproductive but yeah, yeah no true. i know what you okay. mean no, well yeah. maybe in a hallway yeah. somewhere all right uh Karen, there are yeah. five questions to ask every guest first one is what's the single biggest risk you've taken and what was the outcome um single biggest uh i probably have got two but i can only give one go um, on you can give two can i give two you then give two. so i would probably say single biggest was probably fabric in the fact that i had a I was on a good path in a professional job and 
you know, I decided to leave that to um, work on an unknown, you know, construction site in Farringdon on, uh, you know, a disco. And so I would say that at the time was probably um, the single biggest risk. And, you know, obviously that's turned out as it is. But I would say financial and project wise, I would say doing um, another venue down in the O2, which, um, you know, didn't turn out well in the end, um, financially that is, but, but it was a massive risk because, um, you know, it was so much money and we staked so much into it and it was just such a massive project and I'm so proud of it. And, you know, it was an amazing place, but, um, you know, that, that wasn't a, a rip roaring success. Mm. Um, so that was a, you know, that was the biggest risk and it nearly, nearly had the biggest sort of downfall of all. Um, so, yeah, I would say one had a happy, well, has had a happy ending so far and the other one didn't. So Yeah, because I remember Matt, I remember going to mm. a few nights there and loving it, I think it was an amazing experience, but was it just uh, too far out? Um, it was born into the wrong time. Mm. Um, you know, Fabric was born into a time where we could not just make mistakes but we we had the freedom to be able to correct those mistakes and correct what wasn't right and mm. and gi- we didn't have the breathing room with matter you know the day it was born after you know when it was conceived we were probably uh, within our best couple of perhaps our best ever years um and you know banks were falling over themselves to give us the money um but the day it was actually born when it was actually built it was the Lehman brothers crash exactly right. that day and you had, you know, this new word credit crunch and financial institutions. And, you know, we suddenly from wanting to pay back this gigantic loan within kind of two years, we wanted to get it paid back quick, suddenly realized, geez, we need to make this a 10 year loan and mm-hmm. give ourselves the breathing room to be able to handle this horrible world, which was now upon us with mass youth unemployment and, mm-hmm. you know, recession going on where, you know, redundancies, which just had never affected the youth market before they weren't interested in interest rate changes and but suddenly when people were losing their job and graduates are coming out not being able to find jobs that's that suddenly bites into you know a venue and a business you know like we had so you know we were it, it was it was a very unforgiving place coupled with trying to just as we did with fabric put it into a, a location that wasn't um uh, obvious and mm-hmm. it was a very new location for 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 wanting to to get get people to go to it was a de- destination in its own right mm. and suddenly getting um you know having sort of the jubilee line every weekend or nearly every weekend now shutting because they were doing digital upgrade you couldn't you couldn't get to the place convincing people to go there was one thing and when it when it was running it was unbelievable yeah. and we were we had some amazing nights and we were doing sort of you know five five and a half thousand people a night but then when it wasn't running and you're doing 750 mm. you're absolutely lo- you know you're losing a fortune and so we just couldn't we just couldn't battle everything that was in front of us and be able to um restructure ourselves um to be able to get get through it and you know there's only so much you can take and and uh, I think we were what a year and a half so we opened September 2008 and we closed in May 2010 mm. and um you know we we had uh, fabric cross guaranteed against it so you know that wow. pulled fabric into into the into the hole as well so so yeah that was the, it was a really tough time and you know emotionally and you know we put so much into that venue down there it was such a big it was a new build project we didn't take anything over we mm. built it from the first brick that was put down and you know it was a yeah it was a big project and, and you know one that even now I look back and I'm I'm quite sort of I'm frustrated about how that came about mm. timing wise, but, but it was, um, it was really special. I loved it. Yeah. 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 And cause you look now and you see like, um, you know, drum sheds yeah. was where they were again, places not necessarily easy to get to no. massive venues. And yeah, you guys were just super ahead of your time on that. Yeah. And just as I say, you know, just timing of that and the tipping point, um, just, it wasn't in our favor there. So, uh, so look, you live and learn on those. Yeah. 100%. Definitely. Okay. What are you proudest of? I would say the people that we have um, managed to convince and coerce to come and work there over the years, um, losing one of those special people um, back end of the year before last, so just on Christmas Eve, 
um, Sean Roberts, who was our Fabric Live booker for many years. We had his uh, awake back in January last year, and you, there was a coming together of so many people from who had worked there, and you just realised what sort of special. Oh, family is such a horrible <laughs> term for it, but it but it was, and you, you you they haven't lost that, and they haven't lost that sort of affection and what it's moved them on to, and um, I think that was a was a wonderful moment in in some ways. I didn't I wouldn't want to do it, and I, and I was so sad that we had to do it, but but the the night itself was so special in terms of reminding yourself of you know just how many great people you've worked with and how many friends you genuine friends you make um you know that blur between professional and personal um and those relationships while they're arm's length and in the correct place when you're in the office they're people you want to socialize when you're with Mm. outside and that's quite a that's quite a special thing to be able to say that you've had that and have that in your life so um so yeah the the people is 100 percent incredible here Incredible. Thank you for sharing that, Cam. Um, okay, my next one for you is, is there anything you wish you did differently? Um, probably matter, looking back on it. Um, and how I would have done that differently, I don't know. I'd need to think about that. Um, but I would have done that differently. Mm. Um, I think we made some... We weren't hard enough on a number of things there. We, we, I think we've always operated a little bit outside of contract, more on relationships and word. And when people give you that, you kind of go with that. Mm. And even when that's kind of gone wrong or gone against you, you've managed to sort of enforce it or, or navigate it in some ways. And, you know, this was a project that we, um, we probably when others were um, sort of semi-committing to go down to the former Millennium Dome and you had these great names that were going to be involved and then they started running, well, not running away, but not committing. Mm. And we were getting some sort of frantic calls from AEG at the time to say, you're not going to... Because it was the, when the Super Casino didn't go through. Mm-hmm. And that was clearly, for some people, was was a, 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 an important aspect of that space. Mm. And, and we gave them our our word that we were going to go we were we were committed to doing it and and i think at that point we gave our word on things and they committed to us on things that perhaps we should have enforced in contract and i think that those individuals then um pulled back from some of those things and it didn't count for anything and, and i think that was sort of that was where we sort of perhaps fell down a bit and we should have we could have done things differently and I learned a lot from that um and so yeah I I I, a lot of that I sort of regret because I think that sort of changed the outcome and and forced the outcome in a way that we weren't able to Mm -hmm. um yeah to pull that around but you know as I say it is what it is and you you learn a lot and you know it certainly shaped me on on a lot of the way I would conduct things some you know subsequent to that and going forward so mm. yeah and i think it's a great advice right and you speak to every single business owner regardless of the industry right it's the there's always these key mistakes are so frustrating and you're like oh i you know i knew i probably should have done that mm. but it was different and then it's part, part of the fun someone gave me their word and it's yeah like... well that's always the most disappointing part right right Is, um in an ideal world you would be able to operate in that way right um mm. but then once you get burned a couple of times you're like nope got to go down the other mm. road now it's tough one. it is tough and and also reminds you the sort of ponds that you swim in as well because you know i think we we've continued to do that with fabric i, mm. I like doing that i think that's that's a good way of working because you 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 get things done in a much better way and what goes around comes around and those that then break that you, you that you stop working with them yeah and, yeah, yeah. and it, you know it's happened of a couple of times but not many in 25 years but you're suddenly in a world with you know the some of the biggest live promoters in the world <laughs> you're, you know an insignificant little tiddler compared to some of those and you know they just operate in very very different mm. ways and you know i think that's when you kind of yeah 
kind of work out a slightly different um, world and I have done since. And... Yeah, it's super interesting. And um, over the last 25 years of fabric, I mean, from at least from what I saw when, so, you know, I was, I was born in 1991, um, the idea of like being a DJ, what that means and like the people who have gravitated towards that, what it means to be an electronic music mm. from when I was 12 versus now, like it's, it's a totally different thing and has the way that people look at like monetization in the space, people look at like contracts, has that changed quite drastically? Because I imagine the sorts of mm. egos, the setups that artists have now versus what they were 25 years ago. I mean, it must be totally different kettle of fish. Yeah, yeah, it has. And there is a strong acceptance that, you know, artists have um, management teams that, that carefully plan their careers. You know, they, these aren't just sort of, um, you know, have a go heroes and mm. they love what they do and, you know, playing on a Friday night is it and they don't have any social media presence. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different world and it's managed in a different way. So you have to, whereas before we probably would have just scratched out, wouldn't even bother scratching it out. We just wouldn't even, just ignored it. And it's like, you want to play here, this is what we do and this is what we will, and we'll look after you, mm. but this is what we're going to give you. It's not going to be cases of champagne. This is, <laughs> this is what you get rider-wise. And, mm -hmm. It's it, you know there are differences now and and you know the team the team's well placed to to sort of manage that it's it's just a changing it's gradually changed didn't change overnight but mm. it, but it is a different different place now and 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 artists are you know some of them are you know massive yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. huge huge artists yeah. and you know so so there has to be I think the nice thing is I think there's um there's a leveling we still don't do different things for certain artists that we wouldn't do for others they mm -hmm. stay we you know people stay in the same hotel mm -hmm. um you know they get picked up in the same way yeah <laughs> so you know it's we don't have a sort of a hierarchy like that, that yeah um you know we do treat artists the same way um and i think that's really important um and i think you know hopefully the real superstars that's why they love coming back because mm -hmm. there is that sort of I think it's just a personal touch mm. and you know it's the same team so yeah. they know they're where they're going to and I think that familiarity is is repaid with a lot of loyalty as well yeah yeah I mean there's I, there's so many artists that I remember seeing in Fabric and now just seeing like how massive they mm. are and so like, I remember seeing like Skrillex very very early doors in Fabric mm. and like just see how massive an artist these people are now like it's just it's crazy to see um, and it's, that's probably one of hundreds of stories that you've seen you know on on that level mm. um all right my next question for you is what does it take to be successful oh gosh um probably being focused on what you believe you are doing um whether that turns out just as matter did <laughs> um to to not be a success you don't know because um you don't have necessarily everything um and the forces out there going in your way so you know i would say the things that we've definitely got right i didn't approach those in a different way to the things i got wrong mm. um or didn't turn out well for us but we have focused each and every time and given it that particular project everything we've got and and i think we could have easily got distracted on other things you know things come along you particularly you know if you if 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 things are going well and you're getting these kind of other opportunities it's it's making sure the ones that we you pick you absolutely go for it mm. and you know i would say my sort of consulting training at deloitte was one of the things i really learned from that is when to say no to something and and the advice of saying to somebody don't do this mm. could save them millions as opposed to costing them millions um and you know I, i've definitely learned that is saying no to things and then the things that we do to make a success of it is absolutely go for it and i would say yeah definitely the things we've 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 made a success of and being successful at um, we've we've given a hundred absolute hundred percent and not not got distracted on other things. Love that amazing advice. All right, Cameron. My last one for you today is fifteen year old Cameron work, works work, walks in the room right now. What are you going to tell him? I would say just 
do exactly what you've done or you're going to do um, because I don't I don't look at it you know there are things I wish they'd have gone differently but I don't regret anything and and you know it's it's naturally sort of led me on to other things that you know I've certainly haven't talked about but uh, you know other businesses and business sectors that um you know, I never would have dreamed of, I never would have even dreamed of doing a nightclub. It was not what I wanted to do. It wasn't, you know, a 20-year-old me, a 22-year-old me, well, that wasn't what I wanted to do. So it, it, I think I would certainly be telling myself that you will get drawn and dragged into some very, very weird and wonderful directions. And um, I think my 15-year-old self would have been, would be most shocked and surprised at that because I don't think that's what I was heading towards. And now I look at it and love the variety of it. And I don't think I had that in my head at that particular point. So um, I think that would be probably quite helpful if I were told myself that. Mm. Um, because I would probably start looking at things in a much sort of more, in a broader sense, rather than just sort of just the singularity on what I thought I was going to do and perhaps concentrated less on other things. So, yeah, I think that would probably be it. Nice. Love that. And yeah, I mean, all the things that you've worked on from, you know, nightclubs to Web3 and everything in between, like incredible journey. And I know we didn't get to touch on a lot of it, but Cameron, you're a legend. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, if you want to be found or, or what's the best way for people to engage with what you're doing right now? Um, get hold of me through LinkedIn or on email, um, you know, through you. <laughs> there you go. Cameron, you're a legend. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for watching the episode. And if you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe below so that you can support the podcast and we can keep on bringing you amazing new guests. If you want to see the other amazing episodes in this podcast, click into our series section. As ever, if there are any other guests or topics you want us to explore, just let me know in the comments and we'll do our best to bring someone in.